that's not the. No. So I'm pleased to be able to say hi to all of you this morning, and we're gonna make we're not. I don't know what we're gonna do with the video. Maybe maybe not distribute it widely. Could I suppose? But we're gonna talk about a, a question and answer session on. Da, 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 da. Book four. This was the one with kind of the pink and purple overtones in it. This is on First Corinthians and First Peter because of Eden. So what happened when Joy did her research on Genesis three sixteen? These bells went off in my mind. I said, you know, that applies to some passages in the New Testament. Maybe you know you can talk about that. And she said, well, I'm working on the Old Testament. You, why don't you do it? So. Uh, and the Lord helped me out. I, I had my doctoral work on other things in practical theology, and all of those papers were stolen when we went down to Congo in Africa. So I, I lost all of that research, and uh, it was quite devastating to us. And about a year later, two of our colleagues uh, spent some time with us and said, uh, isn't there any other kind of doctoral level research, Bruce, that you did that you could continue your doctoral program with after that theft? And I said, well, yeah, I did do the New Testament passages related to Joy's work on Genesis 2 and 3. And they just kind of looked at me, you know, tilted their head. <laughs> okay, maybe that's, and so that's what I did on the rest of my doctoral dissertation. I worked on Ephesians 5 and 6 and 1 Timothy 2 and 3. And then later on, I got to uh, 1 Corinthians 11, 14 and 1 Peter 3. The question has been raised already. So let's let's talk about this. What about head covering? Anybody who loves the Lord naturally goes to their translation in their own language. So the Germans go to the German translations, the French to the French translation, the Swahili to the Swahili. And we Anglophones, we go to the English translations. And when you go to the English translations in 1 Corinthians 11, it looks like women are supposed to be putting things on their head. And uh, if you kind of hesitate to do that, then the hammer comes down a second time and says, you better do it because of the angels. And when I grew up, everybody had a hat on in church. Well, the men took theirs off and the women kept theirs on. But everybody in the whole society was wearing hats back in those days until John F. Kennedy got inaugurated and, and had a bare head. And so that started changing things. And men stopped wearing at least the fedora kind of hats and shifted to ball caps. So I have a collection of ball caps. This one is from Hawaii. Looks like looks like it says hi, but it actually that's HI for Hawaii. And then my son sent sent us this one. This is this is from Texas. So uh, Lydia and company, you know about Texas. So I, I get to wear this the this one. Oh while well, I'm looking at it, this uh, this hat is a little different. Who's got a hat here? Everybody, you're used to a Santa penguin, right? <laughs> so the grand the grand twins were in my office yesterday, and this is this happens to be beside my keyboard. Not normally there. So let's take a look at 1 Corinthians 11 10. There's a lot of other things in the passage that builds up to it that helps us to know what's going on. Uh, let me just simply say. That in the book of 1 Corinthians, there's a number of places where Paul quotes information he got from Chloe's people and from the letter he got, and he sticks that in, and then he responds to it. And I think what's going on in 1 Corinthians 11 is he's quoting the uh, legalists in uh, in Corinth. And so in my Bible, the paper Bible, I, I put quotation marks around verses 4, 5, and 6. This is where Paul is quoting the bad guys and their proposal. And if you notice then, the idea to it's important to wear something on your head is something from the legalists, something that they're proposing. And then when Paul replies after verse 4, 5, and 6, starting with verse 7, he's, he goes after him and says, I got, I got better reasons to do differently than you're proposing. Then we get down to verse 10, and it starts, what's the very first word in verse 10? depending on whatever translation you have. Can you tell us what the translation is you're looking at and then what the first word is in your English version? Maybe, can I pick on Jenny or you want to be able to do that for us? Except she has her sound off. So you got to un unmute. I got it, Bruce. Okay, Brad, we'll get to you. I want, I'm picking on Jenny here just for fun. Okay. Therefore, in one version and um, 
that is why in another version. So the first one was what? Therefore. Therefore. Okay. And that is why. All right. So it's a, it's a Greek word. They can translate it in different ways and they have. Got a therefore, and that is why. Uh, Brad, what do you have? Uh, for this reason. For this reason. It's an NIV. Mm -hmm. Okay. How about uh, Stacy? What do you have? Uh, I have NASB, and I have therefore. Therefore. And how's our Buckeye? What do you guys have over there? For this reason. For this reason. NRSV. And I have NKJV for this reason. You have the new KJV. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. I have the old KJV and it says, uh, just for an extra one here, and that says, nevertheless, no, wait, it doesn't have it. It says for, it says, huh, the old KJV says for this cause, that's how they start. Okay. So it's kind of up in the air. Is that a big, big point? I don't know. Maybe. So then we look at the rest of that verse. Um, what's the New King James say about that, Lydia, for the rest of verse 10? For this reason, the woman ought to have a symbol of authority on her head because of the angels. Well, they've added some words there. In fact, if you look at the translations, they they some of the translations add up to 15 extra words and when they do that that's so that they're clarifying you know they're they're making it clear the problem is it's already clear with just a few words from the the hebrew from the greek into the english so if it's already clear then their clarification might be because they're trying to argue for something that's not really being said anybody have the living bible translation or the ESV translation? I have that one. It says, um, that is why a woman ought to have a symbol of authority on her head because of the angels. Yeah. Okay. So the word symbol of is not in the Greek. I'll just take you uh, through the Greek. Literally, I'll just read you. Dia tuto. <laughs> Therefore, ophelai ot. Hegune, the woman, exousion, authority, ekane, to have. So therefore, ought the woman authority to have. Epi tes kephales, on the head, or over the head, or regarding the head. Then you've got dia tus angelus, because of the angels. And some translations take that last phrase because of the angels and they stick it up near the beginning or into the middle, uh, etc. because of the angels. And when you do that, it kind of, I well, we'll talk about it somewhere. Anybody have comments on verse 10? What do you think? What's going on here? I have more respect for the NASB that put it, it the symbol of in, in italics compared to the ESV that just sticks it there. So the NI, so there's a there's a translation policy. So in the old King James, for example, if an extra word was thrown in, they would show that with an italics. And the mm -hmm. New American Standard has done the same thing. They show it with italics. Now in the old Bible study days in Akron, Ohio, when we were going through uh, the New Testament together for my four years in university, and we went through the whole New Testament. As it turned out, we had uh, thirty high school and college kids crammed into our my mom and dad's little living room there. And uh, whenever we hit an italicized word like that, we didn't understand what was going on. We thought that was for emphasis because, <laughs> you know, in English, normally, if you have something in italics then you stress it, we didn't realize that it was simply another word that was there, but wasn't really part of the Greek and maybe shouldn't be stressed or emphasized. And the ESV is helping us out there, aren't they? They're just, their standard policy is not to show that kind of stuff. So it might be a translation problem. It might not be. So it, but it helps us to see what the New American Standard is doing. I had professors from the New American Standard when it happened to be when I went to seminary, they had just freshly translated it. So that was fun. We got to talk about that a lot. All right. So in my King James, it says the woman ought to have power on her head. Anybody else have the word power 
in their translation? On, power on her head. Power on, sounds like you need to flip the switch. <laughs> We're good. Power on, <clears throat> we have liftoff. <laughs> the uh, Net Bible says a symbol of authority. Yeah. So uh, let me tell you, because I know Stacy's going to have to run here, and I don't know when. So uh, let me just say what, what it says, please. It says, therefore, I, as I'm looking on my keyboard here, I keep shifting down to verse 11, so I'm a little confused. Okay, therefore, ought the woman to have authority over her own cotton picking head? There, I added a few words myself. But uh, oh, so the woman has authority over her own head. Look, the 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 con the context is they're challenging what can a woman do in church and what should she do when she prophesies and preaches and what can the men do and oh we've got some extra rules for the women, and then Paul comes back and he says oh you have extra rules for the women I don't have any of those rules, you have extra rules for the women I have extra reasons for the women not to do what your extra rules are. <laughs> so then he finishes up that section. And by the way, that's in season nine of the Eden podcast or in the first four chapters of book four in the Eden book series. You can get that because of Eden. So if you want to look at that, we, can, we go deeper. It doesn't cost a whole lot to get the Kindle book. We have priced our Kindle books at a whole, ready for the, the price, 316. Where did I get that? So you can get a Kindle book for three dollars and sixteen cents, and I think some of you can actually get the the Book of Eden for free, if you're part of the some kind of a Kindle program. But uh, anyhow, the the books otherwise are, I don't know, fifteen bucks or something like that. So the whole purpose of this discussion is what did that all lead up to in verse ten? Well, it led up to in verse ten the application of what he's trying to say. So therefore, we have to go back. Back to 1 Corinthians 11, 2. Is he in a good mood or a bad, bad mood when he's writing them what he says in verse 2? Are the, are the Corinthians going to cringe when they read what he's saying, or are they going to blush and, and kind of grin when they read verse 2? <laughs> thumbs up. Sure, thumbs up. So here it is. He says, now I praise you brothers and sisters, that you remember me in all things and keep the ordinances as I delivered them to you. So attaboy, a girl, you're doing great. You've been doing what I taught you. Keep it up. I'm so proud of you. Let's flip to verse 16. What's going on in verse 16? Thumbs up or thumbs down? No, 17, sorry, 17, verse 17. <laughs> yeah thumbs he stuck in his thumb and pulled out a plum so thumbs down so here's the interesting thing and i i don't know how many times i've seen this people say that in first corinthians 11 paul is ripping the church all of that chapter he's criticizing them for being bad guys he's correcting them all because they've been doing bad but it looks to me like starting with verse 17 he's correcting them but from 2 through 16, he's praising them for doing what he taught them to do. And he likes what he taught them to do. <laughs> he says, you know, I got this from the Lord. So it's good if you follow it. Therefore, I praise you for following the traditions I, I gave you. Now, the question is, what were the traditions he gave them? Right. So they're coming out of paganism. They're coming out of Judaism. They're living in Corinth, the seaport city there. Quite a, quite a, quite a immoral town. Uh, all kinds of sailors coming in, all kinds of brothels and temples and stuff going on. It's quite a place. And he was there for more than a year and a half. He starts the church there, and they, they figured it out. Oh, good, Stacy. Thank you. So, all right. So here's, here's what's going on. He says to them, you heard from me to do it a certain way. And now I'm getting reports from Chloe's people who came to visit me here in Ephesus, and I got some letters. And I'm finding out there's some people are, that, that are still challenging me. Did they challenge him when he was in Corinth? It, it, when you read the book of Acts, anybody have fresh in their mind? How did, how did the Jewish synagogue 
people treat Paul when he was in Corinth. Oh, Beth is coming on. Good. Great. If you find the chapter in Acts, that'd be good to tip us off there too. 18. 18. So in, in Acts 18, well, we know how Paul starts, don't we? He always goes to the Jew first. So he starts in the synagogue. He's teaching in the synagogue because why? Because he's the most outstanding rabbi they've ever had. Visit them in Corinth. And of course they want to know what he has to say. This is the student of, of the famed, you know, Professor Rabbi Gamaliel. So here's Paul. They want to have they want to have him come and talk to them. And so he does. But then eh, they begin to do what the chief priests and rabbis did to Jesus. You know, they disagree and they're hostile to him, right? So I don't know which verse it is. I don't have it in front of me, but eventually he leaves there, right? He's not teaching in the synagogue. And how far away does he go? Next door. <laughs> it's so great. Uh, maybe it's because it was the only available place, but maybe, who knows? Uh, that's a great story. Why was he going just, just well, I'll go next door. And he probably preached a little louder. <laughs> they didn't have loudspeakers in those days, but maybe he was a loudspeaker and people in the, in the synagogue got to hear him. Although they would have been worshiping on Sunday and the synagogue would have been on Saturday. I don't know how that worked out. but So here's the deal. He's next door. Oh, right. Go back to the very beginning of 1 Corinthians. Remember how Paul does this? He says, you know, so-and-so and so-and-so and me, we all greet you. Who who does he give credit for at the very beginning of 1 Corinthians? Who does he say is his co-writer here? It's very Sosthenes. interesting. It's the only place that I remember him being mentioned. Sosthenes. Sosthenes. Oh, that's good. And who is Sosthenes? Come on, Bradley, you're a seminary graduate. Well, uh, perhaps the synagogue ruler at Corinth. Perhaps. Yeah, that's right. Perhaps. So... And there was Christian, and you know there was disputing and there was trouble. Somebody got beat, you know, by the by the Roman authorities, etc. <laughs> so there was. So this is very remarkable. The probably, possibly, possibly. I think it's stronger than that. Um, Likely. In First Corinthians, or sorry, in Acts eighteen. Yes. Um. He went. Sorry, I was I was finding some names. He left there and went to a man named Titus Justus, whose house was next to the synagogue. Ah, uh, Acts what? Um, 18.7. So uh, in Philippi, they went to somebody's house. Remember whose house that was? Gaius? Lydia. 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 Oh. No, huh? who was it? Who was who was the seller of purple? Lydia. Okay. Well, here they went to a certain man's house named Justice, whose house joined hard. The old King James says, whose house joined hard to the synagogue. Okay, Crispus, the chief ruler of the synagogue, believed in the Lord. So we know that the ruler of the synagogue believed in the Lord. Uh da -dum, ba -dum, ba -dum. verse 17. Then all the Greeks took Sosthenes, the chief ruler of the synagogue who replaced Crispus, and beat him before the judgment seat. And Gallio said, I don't care. So we know we know there's a Sosthenes that was a ruler of the synagogue, not a believer in Jesus at that point. But I think that's probably who we've got here. So there's some people that say this is the only letter of all of Paul's letters where he does not interact actively with the uh, Judaizers who were trying to bring in the extra Jewish rules and make Christians have to be Jews. And I, I, I don't believe that. I don't agree. We've got Sosthenes as a co-author of the book. We know that, you know, they, they live next door to, or they met next door to the synagogue. We know that Crispus, the ruler of the synagogue became a believer. There's lots of that, lots of Jewish references going on. And I think what we have here in verse four, five, and six is they're bringing in some rules from the Jewish oral law. In fact, 
the words are very similar to the Jewish oral law. That's not the Bible, right? That's the extra rules where Jesus said, you have heard it said, but I say to you, well, where have you heard it said in the Jewish oral law that had strayed from the pure intent of, of the Old Testament? Now, we just got to hit one more verse, very important. Verse 3. Now, he's going to praise them for, for following the traditions, following the, the truth that he taught them. Anybody have trouble with verse 3? What do you think? What do you have for verse 3? You can just read, read whatever your translation says. Getting at man is the head of every woman. Yeah. What what translate? Do you, do you have NASB there? Is that what you're reading? Yeah, I have NASB. And it's not, well, it's Christ is the head of every man, and man is the head of a woman, and God is the head of Christ. Hmm. Anybody else have something a little different? I have NKJV. It says... But I want you to know that the head of every man is Christ. The head of woman is man, and the head of Christ is God. I don't blame people for having trouble with this verse, you know, when they come to it and they try and figure it out. It's it's tough. Let me just give you a hint. It's three lines. The first line is the basic principle, and the next two lines are subordinate to it and give you a partial illustration of it. So the main concept is the first line. So the first line is what? Christ is what? Christ is head. Of? Of every man. Every? Every man. Okay. Now, what does it mean to say Christ is the head of? Well, uh, there are some uh, Fortune 500 companies in, in my town here, and uh, and so-and-so is the head of uh, Medtronic. Okay. Okay. that's that's nice so mr george you're the head of medtronic and so and so is the head of the army and so and so is the head of this and the head of that you know and, and i joy and i founded a christian high school and when we founded it so and so was the principal of of the christian high school now years later we're not involved in there and i go back and i find out that that person somebody else now is not not called the principal but it's called head of school Head of school. Okay, well, there's apparently a lot of schools that do that. So I'm the head of school. Great. That gives me the idea of authority, ruler, you know, big shot. I'm towering over the neck because I'm the head. Uh, just a way of saying things. But that's what we think when we read this verse. We go, Jesus is the boss. He's the head of school. Uh, he's the head of every man. There's a couple of, of interesting wordings going on here. He says every you got to think about that. But let's think about what does it mean to say Christ is the head of something? So in Ephesians chapter, what? There's a parallel. Maybe you have a little reference in your Bible there. Ephesians 5, 20 something. Now we go into Ephesians 5 in book 2. Okay, that's right. So it's Ephesians 5.23. What's it say there? For the husband is the head of the wife, as Christ is also the head of the church. Okay, so we're focusing on that last part. Christ is the head of the church. And then he kind of defines it a little bit. What's he say after that? He himself being the savior of the body. He himself being the ruler of the body. Savior. S savior. Sa oh, savior. <laughs> <laughs> What uh, is that Ephesians 5? 23. 5.23. So we we have we stumble over 523 in Ephesians. It's not what people would think it's gonna say there either, does it? Because it doesn't say Jesus himself is the ruler of the body or the authority of the body or the source of the body. It doesn't say any of those things. It says he's the head of the body. All right, go down to the end of Ephesians chapter five. And we get down to verse 31, I think it is. Oh, hold on a second, Bruce. I'm looking at the Greek here. Yeah. And uh, it, it says uh, in 23, uh, 
the husband and the head of the wife as Christ is the head of the assembly. Yeah, the, yeah. Ecclesia. So yeah, Ecclesia, yeah. Yeah. But that's, you know, we usually just call that church. I got we got a message this morning from a fellow, a professor, uh, an old testament professor in Germany. And he said, Well, how come you, you know, Joy uses this word? And I wrote back to him, I said, Well, that's just the way the English translations just it wasn't a point of doctrine or anything. So he wrote back, he says, Yeah, okay, I see that. We do it a little differently here in Germany. So I think the idea of calling it assembly or church is not the not the issue. We're the called out ones, okay? Ecclesia mm -hmm. called out. Mm -hmm. So we're the church. But I'd like us to look more at, at the at the end of that chapter where he he gives us a reference to to Genesis chapter two. What's he saying? Why is he referring to Genesis chapter two at the end of Ephesians five? Hey Beth, can you uh, can you un unmute and give us a little comment here for us, perhaps? No. Okay. All right. Fine. fine. You're in a territory that's very difficult for me because I don't, I don't, I don't understand why Paul didn't say the same thing to men if, <clears throat> like last week when we were talking about. Um, no, not last week. Last night, Charlotte. Is that live? Right. Thursday. Thursday. Friday, Thursday night, Charlotte and I do Bible study on your seven heresies. And you have, we were on the likewise, likewise. But it just, it, yeah, one of, really, I don't, there's not a book you're telling us about that I we don't have in our arsenal yeah. Yeah. and i'm so thankful for that mm -hmm. uh, <clears throat> and uh we've downloaded joy's thesis and things like that um so some of it is just like why didn't paul <sighs> no that was peter sorry the likewise likewise um and i was so grateful <laughs> for for the clarification but it's just so hard to talk to people who go well you're just overlaying your agenda and i'm going well everybody has brings a bias to the book, but my biggest bias is I want the truth. I don't want to be comfortable. I don't want to have to say things that make me feel good. I want to, I, I want the truth because the rock, you know, shifting, I, I live with um, a particular uh, set of people who are, love the truth, but we're caregivers for a set of people who don't. And there's this thing in that, um, that was uh, one of the Nazi propagandists said, if you tell people a lie long enough, they'll believe it. But if you keep telling it, you'll believe it. And so I just keep going. We really have to say that we want the truth and we have to decide that we want the truth. So as I'm listening to Paul, sometimes I, I just wish that he could see into the future how, how terrifically difficult it, it is to translate him. Okay, all right. And uh, yet, I agree with what the translations are that 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 uh, you and Joy have, have come to, because you so clearly want the Lord more than you want to make a point. So thank you. Yeah, by the way, I want to welcome Rebecca too. She's here on her iPhone. So good to have you, Rebecca. Um, the uh, you talk to me. I, uh, I, I think I was tempted to go down into the little details, and I think I should go back to the big picture. In, in Ephesians 5, Paul is talking about verse 32, Christ in the church. This is a great mystery, something that was hidden before, but is now revealed. That's what the word mystery means. This is a great mystery. And he says, I'm talking about Christ and the church. That's part of a long passage, which is built like a bell curve. And the main idea in the bell curve is at the top or the center. So 532 is the big idea in all of 515 to 69. And he says, I'm talking about Christ and the church. And he gives us an immediate illustration of Adam and Eve in the garden who were married and became one flesh. So he says that just like the two became one flesh, there were a joint body. And he uses the, actually uses the word joint body earlier in Ephesians. So Jesus and the church are in one joint body. They are a unit. And there are other ways we can talk about 
the Hebrew word for one is echad, which means hear, O Israel, the Lord our God is one. That's that's in the Shema later on in Deuteronomy. So there's all kinds of good theology here. But he's he, Paul is is faced with the problem of there are the pagans that are attacking what he's teaching, and there are the Jewish legalists who had gone astray who are attacking what he's teaching. And so he uses their terms. So for example, I live in a town down the road is, is a, the baseball stadium for the Minnesota Twins. So if I, if I just simply say, yay, Twins, anywhere in town, they, they, and I'm, maybe I'm talking about my grand twins, everybody assumes I'm talking about the baseball team. It's just, it's just a given. So when Paul says every man, Christ is the head of every man in 1 Corinthians 11, 3, those people got it. They understood what he was talking about. It was natural for him to talk that way. When he says the head of so-and-so is the head of such and such, he's talking about the unity. Now, this is not a popular view. Right now, there are a batch of churches out there, and they're saying head means boss. And the man should be the head of the home and should be, you know, the, the priest and for the family. And they, they've gone way off and they've got a wrong doctrine and it has bad fruit. And sometimes it, people still can overcome that and they can have good relations. And that's wonderful. <coughs> then there are other people who say head means source. And they're attacked by the people who think it means author authority. And so I'm thinking the idea of source is better and better and kind of more defensible. But I don't think either one of them is right. It's necessary. We don't have to go to those abstract ideas. We just simply have to say we have a head. We have the rest of the body. The two become a whole body. So when he says Christ is the head of every man, he's talking about his unity, Christ's unity with every man. And it's a parallel passage to Ephesians 5.23, where he says Christ is the head of the church. So every man and the church are the same idea for Paul. Now, how is it possible that he would say, instead of saying the church, he would say every man? Because he's addressing the dispute where these people are, these Judaizers, you know what a Judaizer is, right? A Judaizer is someone who, make, who wants to make the Christian church more Jewish, according to those Jewish legalistic rules. And so these Judaizers are saying, I'm talking about the males and males and males compared to the females. And he says, Christ is the head of every male clang they're going what and they know he means christ is uni uni united with males and females who make up the church and then he gives an illustration of unity having said that men and women are united with him in the church now he has two sub illustrations so verse three he says for example the man and the woman are in one joint body and then he says christ and god are united in the trinity doesn't bring up the Holy Spirit there, but that's he's talking about unity in the Godhead. So he's saying this is the good theology that males and females in church with Christ are united, husbands and wives in marriage are united, Jesus and God in the Godhead are united. That's our good theology that I've taught you before and you're trying to practice. Therefore, verse 10. Therefore, verse 10. Therefore, a woman has authority over her own cotton pick and head. You don't have to add extra rules to her and she doesn't have to practice that kind of stuff. She's not under somebody else's authority because if you put a, something on your head, that shows there's symbolism there. We won't, I don't think we have time to go into that, but we don't have to worry about that symbolism. A woman is in charge of her own head. Now, what aspect of wearing something on the head is he concerned about? Then he adds it. You know what he's thinking about now. He says, because of the angels. There are really strange things where they say, you know, the angels are up there hiding in the rafters somewhere. <laughs> Women have to be careful and they have to, you know, cover themselves up because they don't, you don't want to, you know, tempt the angels and oh, they get into all kinds of strange things. Just go back to 1 Corinthians 6. Can we read the first couple of verses in 1 yeah. Corinthians 6? Who haven't I picked on recently here? I don't <clears throat> Mom, do you want to read that for us? What verse? First Corinthians. Uh, one, two, and three, I think. When any of you has a grievance against another, do you dare to take it to court before the unrighteous instead of taking it before the saints? 
Do you not know that the saints will judge the world? And if the world is to be judged by you, are you incompetent to try trivial cases? Do you not know that we are to judge angels to say nothing of ordinary matters? So when we think about angels in 1 Corinthians 11, we're supposed to think about what he previously said in, in chapter 6. We are going to judge the angels. Yeah, we are. And we are capable to judge ourselves, even instead of going to the law courts. And women are capable to judge whether or not what I taught should be practiced. And what I taught was women and men, every man, and that's he's sarcastic here. You know, he's every man, every male. Oh, yeah. Males? No, every male. <laughs> in other words, the believers, the church. We are united in Christ, and we are to go forth, use the gifts we're given, and practice that in in uh, in enthusiastic obedience to what Christ did for us. It was tough. <laughs> Nobody says anything. I missed that comment. She said so, nobody says anything. All right, I try one more time because you talked over each other. Go ahead, Lydia. What did you say? Oh, I was just saying what Rebecca said. I, she, I think she just commented that no one was saying anything. Yeah, you're right. Okay, good. So I well, wasn't I wasn't either. Let me just say one thing. Go ahead. If if the husbands were practicing what Paul said in another letter to the Philippians 2:5. Let this mind be in you. Then the husbands will be loving uh, the, the wives as Christ loved the church. Yeah, sure. yeah, yeah, yeah. There's all good. There's kind of cross references that can support what he's teaching them. Um, I'd like to stay in the context of this dispute where they're, they're going after Paul. By the way, in 1 Corinthians 14, for example, they come up with more of this. In verse 6, 11, 6, I think it is, it says it's a shame. And you talk, the word in Greek is ice cross. That's, a, that's, an, that's an offensive word. You, I'm surprised to see Paul use that. Well, he's not using it. He's quoting the bad guys who use it. They're quoting, they're using the Jewish oral law. And in the, go back into the Jewish oral law, and you'll see that they use that word, shame, ice cross, a very severe word. Now go to 14, 1 Corinthians 14 up to 34 and verse 35 you can put quotation marks around 34 and 35 so he's quoting them again and then you can see that it is because starting with verse 36 he interacts with that quotation <laughs> he says what and and then he then he goes on to correct them and put them down and it's a wonderful passage as long as you understand these aren't paul's words in verses 34 and 35 these are the bad guys trying to impose more restrictions again on the women what does he go on with verse 35 then to say if they want to ask something ask it at home yeah that's so that's part of their laws you know women you know you gotta you gotta do this you gotta do that you gotta shut up in the church that's part of the jewish oral law teaching and then it says it's a shame for women to speak in the church and so you know we're trying to figure out what are they doing there and how can we apply this we don't have to apply it this is this is them. This is shut up. We don't we don't like it. He's just bringing this out to parade it before us and say, look at this terrible stuff they're saying. Now, I'm going to contradict it. And then he says this, verse 36. What? And he lists four things. He said, did the word of God only come from you? Or are you the only ones who knows what's going on? Do you consider yourself? He lists four things. And I was in a very obscure place. I forget whether it was in France or Africa. And I was reading a French commentary by a Jewish scholar, Joachim Yeramias, in French. And it was in the it was in the appendix. It was at the end of four or five hundred pages. And he's talking about the uh, the scribes. And I was I was studying about the scribes. It was not in reference to this passage, but he said the scribes were four things. They thought that they were the only keepers of the word of God. They thought they were the only ones that are putting out the word of God. They even called themselves prophets. And then there were four different things. Here's the fun thing about prophets. When the scribe walked down the street in, in ancient days, you didn't say, hello, scribe uh, Ben Shemel or something. You would say, hello, rabbi. 
because the scribes taught them. No, not rabbi, not even that. They would say, hello, prophet. You had to call them by the title of prophet. And they and, and people said, why should we call you by prophet? Say, well, we're the modern prophets. We're the ones telling you what God's word is. And they said, yeah, but in the Old Testament, a prophet had to be confirmed. If they, if they had something that they prophesied for hundreds of years out, they had to prophesy something that was 100 days out or something close. And then that near near-term prophecy had to take place. And if it didn't, then we knew that we were a false prophet and we got to stone you to death. So rabbi or uh, scribe, uh, do we get to stone you according to those rules? No, no, no. We're the modern prophets. We're better than those prophets because we don't need verification. <laughs> In other words, you don't need to check us out and threaten us with stoning. They, look how they lifted themselves up. It's just incredible what they what they did. And Paul lists these four things in verses 36 and 37, showing that he's responding to the scribal oral law. He's responding to those people that are trying to bring their rules in there. And he's saying, I reject all of that. And then he ends up at the end of the chapter and he says, you know, look, just let everything be done decently and in, in order the way I taught you to do that. When I was growing up, it was a joke that the Presbyterians, that was that was their key verse in life. Let everything be done decently and in order. Uh, <laughs> yeah, so the Baptist, so, Baptist didn't claim that verse. But. <clears throat> so Charlotte and I are at a point of a, a bit of a weariness because we're in a highly complementarian, highly nationalistic, you know, Christianity should be the rule of law in America culture within a culture here in college station <clears throat> and you wouldn't think that <clears throat> but that's where we are and so we're dealing with um people thinking that all of the research that we're doing is useless and and yet i know it's it's if you don't understand the cultural context, if you don't understand the original Greek words, it's, or Hebrew, or Aramaic, or Masoretic text, or all these things, you're going to have a really hard time understanding the great love of God um, and how he works in spite of us. Not This isn't who God is. So she was, she was with a counselor who believes that Adam is completely 100% responsible for Eve, because God spoke to her first. And I was looking all over your books to try to find, because I know you spoke to that. Um, because um, yeah. about the, the only thing that I could find was that if God had spoken to Eve first, it would have made Adam out to be a victim. When God spoke to Adam first, he was speaking to Adam on Adam's own sin. <clears throat> I don't. I I, I, I. I don't know. In the last two weeks, I've had reason to look at this again, and I don't know if it. Kind of, you know, I don't know if we're building on or whatever. But let me let me put it this way: God talked to. Uh, he called them. He comes into the garden in the evening of the day, at the cool of the evening, and he says, "Adam, you know what's going on?" And Adam is their name. Yes. Okay. So Thank there they you. go. And and who started? Who ate first? She did. Okay. And who did the talking? She did. And so God calls out and says, what's going on? And he speaks up. I was talking to Joy about that just yesterday. I said, you know, what, what about that? Can we make a big deal out of that? And she said, well, maybe, but uh, we can't make too much out of it because it, we can't make the text say something it doesn't say. So it doesn't say why he spoke first or all that kind of stuff. But she says, it's cer we certainly can think that he called them both. And then the man decided, I'm going to speak up first. When he does, he speaks up all for himself. I did this. I was that. I'm, you know, I, 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 I. So he's very, now before he's happy to be married, you know, oh, we're together. This is great. And now it's just all me. You know, I'm, I'm the rebel and I'm doing this. So, so God ends up talking to the man first. Then it's her. She's the other one. So in verse 13, he talks to her, right? So he talks to her. And when he does, she mentions the one who deceived her. Now, God is going to still talk to her in verse 16. He starts talking to her. I don't have the old, I got my New Testament Greek here. He talks to her. Is it Genesis 3, 13? I think it is. Starts talking to her. And he's going to continue to talk to her in 3, 16. 
And then he's going to come back to the man. So he asked the man, you know, he, he talks to the man. Okay, now it's her turn. He's talking to her. She mentions the serpent tempter. And so God says, just a second, Eve. He didn't call her Eve because she didn't have that name yet. But excuse me, ma'am. <laughs> and he turns to the serpent and he says, you know what? She just outed you. And I, she's right. And you did attack her and you deserve punishment. And I see that there's a combat going on. You've been after here and her, and now she's outed you. I'm going to confirm that enmity, that com combat that's going on. Some people say, oh, God now made her an enemy. No, they were already in conflict at that point. God confirms the enmity between the two. And then he finishes speaking to the serpent. And now he says, okay, let's get back to our conversation. He's talking to her. That's why he's talking to her in 316. And now he's going to get back to the man. So he starts judgment on the serpent, 14 and 15. Judgment, not as severe to the woman. To the serpent, it's all negative. To the woman, there's negative and positive. Then he gets to the man and it's all negative. He talks to the serpent and the man in exactly the same parallel terms. There's six ways that he talks to the serpent and the exact same six are used for the man. And none of those six are used for her. So the two rebels, the rebellious angel and the rebellious man, get treated. Each one gets a curse. And the woman doesn't get a curse. And none of those elements are talked to her. And he gives her the good. So he's talking to her. Why at that point? Because he's just finishing up the conversation with her. Wait a minute. I, I mean, I rebellious. The, 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 uh, Adam was not cursed. Isn't that right? No, there was a curse because of him. A curse on the ground mean, and a curse on Satan. That's right. Absolutely yeah. right. Yeah, God didn't curse either human. Yeah, go ahead. Do you mean rebellious angel or rebellious serpent? Because you said oh, rebellious I angel. I don't think serpents had a whole lot of, of interest in saying anything, you know. So it's the it's this angel that's this tempter that that animates the the serpent. We always call him the serpent tempter. And then elsewhere in the Bible, he's called the dragon, and you know, but we know it's Satan. So you're saying that Adam, when God said, Adam, where are you? He was speaking to the both of them. It looks like could, it, it looks like he was speaking to the both of them. It certainly doesn't rule it out. The way he said it was, you know, could be them both. And then the man, you know, is this where the man starts to be, you know, aggressive and just jumps in and, and starts doing his thing already? He certainly is rebellious. He doesn't even mention the serpent tempter. And yet God says to him, how do you know that you're naked? You know, how, who did you listen? Who you've been listening to? He could have said, I, oh, I listened to that voice over there from that serpent tempter. Doesn't even mention him. How many kids have you ever seen? You know, when you come into the, into the kitchen and there's something spilled on the floor, um, how many kids try to distract you? You know, and, and so I, there's a whole lot going on there where, with the, with the man. And it's not good. Okay, so now what we have here is when God approaches Eve and he talks to her, not about all bad news, but he gives her bad news. You're going to have sorrowful toil when you work the cursed ground because I'm going to curse it because of the man. And you will be doing field work too. So you're going to have that. And you're going to have conception. You will bear the seed who will crush the head of your serpent tempter enemy. So he's got good news. And bad news, he says to her, uh, you will have children in fulfillment of the creation mandate, although you'll have sorrow as a mother. And she did with Cain and Abel and Seth and then the children of Cain. So, and, but I look in your heart, your desire is still great. Your desire is toward your husband. You know, you got, you got a good desire for him, but he so that was good news. Here's the bad news. He he desired, desired he, desi he, he decided to reject my rulership over him, and he decided to rule himself. And now he's also going to usurp my rulership over you, ma'am, and he's going to rule over you too in sin. And a lot of people act as if God told her, you go do this. That's not what happened. God said, I will put enmity between between you and the serpent, there was a conflict there. 
when there's a conflict between the woman, so, so this woman ruled over the, you could say, had dominion over the serpent. When the subject of having dominion over her comes up, God doesn't say, I will put him in a position to have dominion over her. He doesn't say that. Not there at all. And yet people act as though he, now the man is supposed to have dominion and it's God's will. It's just not the way the text goes. That's going to, those details are going to come out in tomorrow's episode of the Eden podcast, by the way, where I'm reading from Joy's yeah. dissertation. And so that some of that actually comes out it's either tomorrow That's or, very helpful. Yeah, or next week. I forget. I've been listening. I posted both of those episodes. I forget which it is, but yeah. I've been, I've been, I've been, um, so I know that you have said some likes on Pete Briscoe's kind of angelical and there was a particular person, um, and I won't say his name because you're videoing it. He said, they don't say women are not to lead men in church. God does. I do not permit a woman to teach her or to have authority over man. She must be silent. First Timothy 2, 12. Do you know better than God on this? You sarcastically challenge him in your post. So it seems like you think you do know better than God. And so, of course, I had the audacity. Uh, and then he says, silent with regard to leadership over men in the church. Zero support in scripture for idea that women should lead men into churches. Perhaps you have a verse. So I had the audacity to post about Jun Paul calling Junia a woman apostle, which is a high authority. Uh, and that Paul commends highly. And then I said, best research explanation of 1 Timothy 2 that I know of so far. And then I did the hashtag. The Eden podcast, Bruce Fleming, Bruce C.E. Fleming, and then the Spotify uh, connect to it. And then I even took a long screenshot of the, the intro words. <clears throat> First Timothy 1, a necessary contextualizing preamble to chapter 2, is thoroughly considered and discussed in the previous Eden podcast ep episode by Bruce C.E. Fleming. Here, that one, long thing. And guess what he says? Without reading. No, it's a twist of clear scripture to fit a desire. And I said, it is scripture. By listening and reading, you would know. <clears throat> the links I sent to you are biblical scholarship, yada, yada. And then I just sent him several more things. And I said, the last thing I said is, this is going to take some time to read and, and listen to, but you did ask for proof. Now, is this and some I, guy or is this Pete himself? Oh, it is not Pete. Yeah, okay. Pete and uh, you yeah. are and you are quite yeah. uh, in agreement on these things yeah. and <clears throat> although pete I, I, don't, I, don't, I don't think pete knows about joy's work on 316 if he did that no would... and i keep trying to tell him i have sent him private messages because i've known of him since 2014. yeah <laughs> yeah we are we are the glee club here sir <laughs> that's good that's good and of course pete's pete's mom and dad did had a wonderful ministry in in wisconsin and and so we're we're aware of them too. Okay, we're hitting at the time at our time limit. So what's what can we do? Let me give you a couple of commercials. Yeah. Uh, not this coming Monday, but a week from this Monday, Mimi and I are going to do a complete workshop on Book Four. So this is uh, the book on First Corinthians eleven fourteen and First Peter three, and we even have a section on women in ministry throughout the Bible in that in that book. So that's that's coming up. And if you want to sign up for that, I'm going to be, I don't know if it's up on true316.com or I think it is, or it will be soon. So that's something you can sign up for. If people have never taken a workshop before, it costs a whole $69. And if you don't want to pay that, but you would like to support the True 316 Foundation, simply go to true316.com slash partner. And anybody that gives a donation to be a true partner, gets free tuition to, to take the true school workshops. I was part of one session Thursday evening. We had a ball. <laughs> we were going through, uh, we're going through the first Timothy uh, passage for that. And, and uh, you were part of that, right, Brad? Yeah. yeah. So um, I appreciate, I can tell you that, we have slowly begun to see an increase in donations to the True 316 Foundation. Each month, we have a, have a hundred dollars more. So, go back. It was a whole two hundred dollars, then a whole three hundred dollars. So each month, it's going up by a hundred dollars, and uh, that's tremendous. We're, we're doing. We're seeing some income coming in there. We got about two more years worth of a hundred dollars a month to go, <laughs> but but it's happening. And uh, we received a neat neat donation just yesterday too. So. 
there are, <clears throat> there are good things going on. Um, so Joy says hi. She's uh, she's not able to be part of this workshop, but she or this uh, this session. Next week we're going to talk about the Book of Eden and our Saturday thing, and then the last Saturday we're going to talk about Beyond Eden on Ephesians five and six. So that's what's coming up for our Saturdays. I don't know if you want me to keep doing Saturday sessions beyond this month. You know, let me know. Give me some feedback. One more thing: we're four. We lack four to hit 50 reviews on Amazon. And it's just something somebody goes in there and just gives us a five-star review. And they say, would you like to add a paragraph? And you could, but you don't even have to do that. Once we get 50 clicks like that on Amazon, apparently it triggers the algorithm and it starts to show the book to more people. So we're up to, we're up to 46 right now, which is really good. Because last time I checked, we were 32 or something. Now we're up to 46. So... Uh, if you know anybody or you have you are one of these people and you haven't reviewed it yet, that'd be really great to go on Amazon, the Book of Eden, and just give it a five-star review or a one-star, whatever. But we need to get the uh, 50 reviews there. Anything else anybody wants to mention? It's, it's at this point that Mimi will come on and give a commercial, and I she's not I, here. I got a question for you. I don't yeah. know if this is the appropriate time. Have you read Murray Harris's From Grave to Glory? No. You hmm. haven't? I took him for Greek, but I don't. I well, have it, it's his defense against those who were calling him a uh, giving heretical teaching. Oh, interesting. Yeah, no, I have. And, and Dr. Kaiser is one of the people that supports Harris in the book. But if you haven't seen that, uh, I think you might be very interested in reading some parts of it. Yeah. yeah. Uh, Harris, of course, taught uh, the creatorial order in uh at, at least that's where i learned it from yeah well then i would disagree with him on that but yeah uh, so, but yeah i mean that's so many people have and um but harris was vindicated by uh the attack that geisler made upon him mm -hmm. and he wrote a whole book yeah which uh it is brilliant so Geisler was a Thomist and he would come at him from that philosophical basis. And yeah, I, I don't, I'm not surprised. Yeah. Yeah. It really doesn't fit to this conversation here, but that's okay. <laughs> so Sorry. thanks Brad. Okay. Okay. So I'm going to say goodbye to Stacy and to Lydia and to Buckeye mom and to Beth and Rebecca. And I'm missing somebody who have I got? Oh, Denise. Hi, Denise. And Mahefa is on too. Great. Okay. And Thank Brad. you. Thank you for your time. This is always enriching. All right. Thank you, everybody. Go, keep going back to true316.com. I keep trying to update that so you'll see what's going. Oh, did you see the did you see the uh, YouTube interview on there? Yeah, I, I haven't had a chance to review yeah. it, but I'm going to. I yeah. saw I saw yesterday you you uh, posting yeah. it somewhere on Facebook or day before yesterday, and I'm going. Yes, I can't I'll, wait. I'll I'll tell you. Her, she goes by the name Divine Dissident. Yeah. But her real name is Laura. So now you know. So that's Laura. Okay. All right. All right. Thanks, everybody. We'll see you. Thank you. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. Y'all have a good one. Everybody have a great day. Blessings.